Well, let me just uh, make a quick introduction. Again, thank you all for being with us today on uh, the Complex Coronary Intervention uh, webcast. It is a great pleasure and privilege to have Dr. Bill Lombardi. I don't think he needs any introductions because everyone knows him. He is the father of CTOs. In uh, North America, he's trained uh, many, many of us, most of us actually, in doing these complex procedures, and he's always leading the way in the latest and greatest and finding ways to open this um, artery. So, Bill, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us today and looking forward to seeing your cases. Well, thank you, Manas. I appreciate you having me. And um, we'll try to, we're doing this a little bit on the fly, as you know, so we're going to try and come up with some interesting cases just to show some uh, different technical approaches and walking through how you manage sort of potentially severely ill patients. So the first case is a 63-year-old gentleman with an EF of 20 with viability in his infra wall and class 3 to 4 angina in the setting of previous coronary bypass graft surgery. And uh, he was um, fairly ill, actually came in through the emergency department with recurrent symptoms. So because of his low EF and because of the potential need to do retrograde through a uh, last remaining conduit, which was his Lima, um, we wanted to do the case with hemodynamic support. So the first picture is actually, this was done as part of the SHIELD-2 trial. So most people are very familiar with Impella. This is uh, essentially the PROTECT-2 trial being redone with Impella versus a new device called the PHP device from St. Jude. And the, the concept of this device is it has a nitinol cage that is unsheathed, and you end up with a much larger impeller. It's 14 French across the valve. And the impeller is such that you run at a much lower RPM and you can get higher flow rates. It's up at, we've seen as high as six uh, liters per minute of flow in our patients. So this is the PHP device going in. You can see it right here across the aortic valve. And we used a pigtail catheter just to mark the aortic valve. And Bill, how big is the device in the groin? How much it, it's, you it's, it's 14 French in the groin okay. and 24 across the valve. So you can see in this view as we're unsheathing, you can sort of see the nitinol cage being unsheathed, but it stays 14 French, and that sheath you're seeing come back is 14 all the way. And that's probably one of the downsides of devices. It is a large device. It probably really favors being done transcavally if you have that option. Great. But otherwise, the same access size as the impeller, essentially, right? Exactly. It's the only difference is the leave-in access. You know, it's the in the impeller you get the peel away sheath and you re leave a residual nine in. So if you have to leave these in long term, or this if you have to leave it in, you're gonna have to leave a 14 French in. Sure. So that's just unsheathing the impeller. We get on support. This is our setup shot. So you can see again, sort of very complicated anatomy here. You can see the uh, distal right coronary PD PL bifurcation. You can see the previous insertion of the vein graft right here. And then there's a reasonable landing zone, though not great, and a very heavily calcified diffuse disease right. The proximal cap doesn't seem to be horribly ambiguous. And again, given that the retrograde option in this case was going to be uh, through a lima and a last remaining vessel making it high risk, the strategy was to do anti-grade reentry with a high-end retrograde reentry bailout. The advantage of doing the anti-grade reentry also was such that if we did have to go retrograde, in theory, we'd be across the collateral for a shorter period of time because we'd already done most of the anti-grade prep work. So, and for people who are not familiar with this, you know, how often do you go down through Lima? I know Lima is always a kind of a worrisome thing. Uh, you know, not super frequent. I, I don't have an exact percentage of, of the time I've done that in post-cabbage patients, but it's not a frequent. The lima is actually pretty tolerant of a Corsair and a, a catheter. What you really have to do before uh, getting down it is really pay attention to the angiogram of how tortuous the lima is. Um, and if it's moderate, it's really tortuous. One of the things you can do is actually wire down it, put a Corsair down it, and then take a picture. Because if you don't see brisk flow with that, then you're likely to get profound ischemia and get into significant trouble. Um, and again, that's another reason why to consider hemodynamic support is you know the patient's going to get profoundly ill while you're working and be prepared for that. Perfect. So this is just, uh, you know, the proximal vessel was very calcified, and we had issues getting devices through this first portion. So we've got a wire in, we did a, a balloon inflation. We're now working with other stiffer wires trying to get into the architecture of the calcium. And you can see here in this orthogonal shot, we're actually a little bit outside of the calcium track, so that's not really where we want to be. 
So we come back and we're working, trying to get a knuckle going, and we cannot get anything to penetrate what's the proximal cap. And we finally, with significant push and force, get a knuckle started. And the key with that is being able to have enough guide support and catheter support. So the wire breaking loose like that, that's a great look, right? You've got a nice size of the artery, and you're now into the subintimal space. We're going to check that in our orthogonal view before we move our microcatheter forward. We now feel very confident we're in the architecture of the vessel. So at this point, we'd come down, and we missed the cross boss because I forgot to floral store it, so I apologize. Now I have a Miracle 12 down near the reentry zone. Here is a Stingray balloon, and you can see it right next to the contrast that's just above. We're trying to stick both uh, ports because we're not totally clear whether we're above or below the vessel. And, and they able throughout all this with the device, no problems. Obviously, you didn't do anything to the Lima anyway, right? So. Yeah, we, so after we got the knuckle going, we, we finished out with the cross boss. And again, I apologize for not saving that. We then had no issue delivering the stingray, went in smoothly. And then we, we did what's called stick and swap and actually stuck both the upper and lower ports and then swapped both upper and lower ports. And we did that twice and could not get successful reentry into the distal right. So at this point, it's time to move to the next strategy, which would be retrograde. Okay, but you have everything down there all the way, so I guess that's good. You don't have that much space to do. When you go exactly. There. You can see we, we left the knuckled wire at the distal cap, so everything's set up so it'll be very, hopefully, efficient to do reverse cart when we get there. Now, you can see that the, the best collateral here is actually proximal to the insertion of the IMA. Um, unfortunately, my success in getting to those has been very, very low, and you can see the tortuosity here. So this is essentially going to be unusable. So you have this septal here, and potentially one or two more distal and or apical collaterals off the LAD, they're going to be our targets to do reentry. Again, the lima is somewhat tortuous, which is going to be an issue, and again, that's why we used the hemodynamic support, which is that even if we got him ischemic, we knew we could support him for the length of time we needed to do the procedure. Perfect. And Bill, when you do that, and you have only one or two you use of collaterals, you do usually you still do surfing, or you try to do contrast, contrast injection here? Yeah, so we I tried one very brief surfing, it didn't work, so I decided to go ahead and do a contrast injection just to make sure it communicated. And again, you can see this is the collateral pathway that you're trying to get into. So there's a lot of tortuosity here, so this is favoring using a Xion guide wire to cross. You know, Xions are very torqueable. They have this, the Act 1 core, it's spring coil, so it's less likely to perforate. So I tend to favor Xion when I see visual, visibly tortuous vessels. I tried another tip, tried went, I couldn't get across that, so I tried another tip injection just to find another pathway, which is through a Corsair in a high flow state like this is usually not as effective as you'd like. So I'm trying to go further out to find a selective picture. I eventually went further out into the APCO ID, and you can now see the wire has gone down, gone through another collateral, and then back up into our donor vessel. And you can also see the old graph insertion here. Does those, those doesn't worry you when you go far, that far down, maybe a little bit cardiac there, does it worry you, or I guess it was smooth and you, that's okay? Um, I mean, this is certainly not something, if you haven't done a lot of these, um, this was, you know, I was basically doing it fairly blind, and so it was all done by feel, and so I did it mostly by the feel and the motion of the guide wire. The guide wire was moving with zero resistance and very smoothly, and so I just kept tracking it. Once I got to a place that looked good and felt good, I took this picture to confirm I'm in the correct location so that I can do, now bring the Corsair across to start setting up reverse cart. Great. So Corsair comes across, and you can see we'd left our anagrade wire in place. We had some issues at the PDPL bifurcation that this was somewhat very tortuous, and you can see the Corsair and the amount of tortuosity that we're dealing with. So we had some difficulty with guide wire manipulation. Um, and I did make sort of one technical mistake here, which is, I was in the left radial for the Lima, and I used a 90-centimeter guide, but I should have cut it to about a 60-centimeter guide because I, I basically ran out of Corsair length near the proximal vessel. And um, because of the tortuosity, as we got into doing reverse cart, it was very difficult to manipulate the retrograde wire. Uh, you can see that in these very tortuous vessels sometimes. So it actually would have been better to do old-school cart, bring a retrograde balloon in, 
and dilate. That way I would have anti-grade wire control. Um, unfortunately, because I, I had not been wise enough to cut and shorten the guide up, I didn't have enough reach to get a balloon across. So we finally get Corsair into the PD. We, you can see we've got an anti-grade balloon right here, and we're just working the retrograde wire up against and trying now to deliver a guide extension. So we're going to do classic guide extension reverse cart. So now we've brought the guide extension all the way down here where you can see it. You can see the Corsair next to it. And I'm trying to do reentry. Obviously, manipulation is tough. So one of the things here is I got the retrograde knuckle up is people tend to get stuck into a geographic position. So in this case, you can do reentry anywhere from here distally to all the way essentially up here approximately. And so if you're having difficulty with a reentry, don't be afraid to move your position longitudinally to allow yourself to get set up for success. So again, here we are. We've moved up into the vertical portion of the right coronary. We've got a guide extension in place. And you can see the retrograde wire, and this is a guy a third, now successfully crossing into the anti-grade guide liner, completing the reverse cart. Perfect. I don't know if you use the, the Maurer's technique that you do the draft thing where you put a loop retrograde and the balloon pulls it back and pushes the loop in, or um, just the standard guide liner reverse card? Or... I, I tend to do guide liner reverse card. I think it's a little bit easier. Um, in this case, it also was important to me, so I wasn't sure I was going to have enough Corsair length to get to the integrate guide. So by bringing the guide extension in, you can do your wire exchanges on a, in a shorter place. So we had done a 3-5 balloon, which you can see sitting up in the guide extension here. So we've done a 3-5 balloon down in this area and then done a re-entry. Great. Then we externalized and stented. We did an osteo flash. So this is a technology that allows you to sort of intentionally miss the ostium of the vessel and allows you to flare the stent or flute the stent more aggressively. So, you know, for me, for doing osteo rights and osteo left veins, you really want to make sure you get the ostium covered, but you don't want to leave a lot of struts hanging in space. So this is a way that sort of is the best of both worlds. You know that you can get the ostium covered, and you can do a much better job of flintering the stents, struts out of the way so that if you have to come back at a later date, you won't have to deal with going through struts. Now, you can see down here we have a lot of kinking and we had not stented across the bifurcation. We tried to land at it, we were short, and we decided because of this and what the guy's going on, we would just stent across, so we brought in a stent more distally. And Bill, what's your thinking? Sometimes you don't want to leave those and let them recover by themselves, or I guess here it didn't look that great, I guess. So don't take any chances. This, this one I was worried because I really knew the disease went to the bifurcation, and I had, I'd sort of, I was shorter than I wanted to be. So in this case, I decided to go ahead and stent across. It's a little bit of a dealer's choice on those things. Um, but in this case, I thought we, we'd end up with a better result if we went ahead and stented it. So I did. I think that, I don't think any of us have the right answer. I think that the key is to make sure that you have very good outflow to whatever you do. Um, and as long as you have good outflow, then you're in a, a position where you can, come, if you need to, you can come back later and have a good result. Perfect. So we removed our retrograde gear, and this is our final picture showing uh, complete revascularization on this patient. And the PHP device was then recaptured, and after a little bit of nitroid and caging better. And I think we show the So we're going to pull the PHP, just showing the lima, that we did not damage it. The collateral was OK, which is always very important. And we don't have the capture. The, sorry, don't have the capture. That was a fairly tortuous Lima too, so it worked out pretty well. Yeah, and again, the 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 key with the in this case was because it was tortuous and it's the last remaining vessel. That was to me the importance of doing the PHP device or an impeller device. Either it is, you know, for me the the role of hemodynamic support is you have to think about what's the potential a patient can be profoundly ischemic. That's, you know, that's when they're going to get sick and have trouble if they have a low LV function and low hemodynamic reserve. So retrograde, to me, and somebody with a low EF makes my threshold for hemodynamic support go down significantly because it's going to allow me the time and comfort 
to complete the procedure and do what the patient needs to have. Sure, absolutely. Well, it's interesting. We had a case um, a couple of days ago, actually. We were doing that in a patient that's very similar. And then we had the problem. We're doing a reverse car. Couldn't engage the undergrade. It was a flash occlusion with a, with a, with a regular, with a radial guide. So I ended up actually removing, after we done that, removing the impeller. It was an impeller case. And then putting the guide femoral to complete it. But I'm not sure running that problem where you, because you use a radial femoral when you do those, you run a problem with support when you use a radial. Yeah, and that's, so we tend to do a lot. We're doing actually about 50 or 60% of our CTOs now are radial femoral. So we're doing significantly more. We've actually started doing a few biradials after working with Cal uh, Aliswad and learning some of his tricks and techniques to get large ball catheters in and or using uh, sheathless guides. So uh, we have been looking at that. I'm trying to find. Um, so, you know, we have looked at those, but uh, trying to come up with another case for you. I'm sorry. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so we've um, definitely looked at that, and we, we actually we just looked at our data. We've done about 17 CTOs now with hemodynamic support, either in the setting of a surgical turndown or, um, you know, just as isolated support. And we actually have an abstract of about multicenter with about 50 patients uh, looking at this. Perfect. Let me see if I can. Very, you know, there's a lot of uh, questions out there about the use and how to do it in um, CTOs as a complex cases. So every data will be very, very useful. Actually, Carl yeah. is looking at that in progress as well. So it's perfect to get some extra stuff in there. Yeah, I'm trying to remember this lady's name. Why is it? Oh, there it is. So I think the last case that you saw was beautiful because there's so many so many things to think about. It had the hemodynamic support component with low EF. It was retrograde. It was through Lima. It was difficult getting through the collateral, difficult dissection entry. And I think the, the nice thing is that the, how you move along. You don't just spend time in something. It doesn't work. Just move on to something else, something else, as you, as you always say, until you get it uh, done. Yeah, I think that the key to be able to do that is to have a lot of comfort level that that you're comfortable with all the techniques to a, a level of degree that allows you to move to the next um, option. And I think a lot of people get stuck in a mindset of saying, well, this is the option I'm going to execute. And what you really have to do is accept failure fairly quickly and easily. You can always come back and work on it some more. But if you have another option available, it's worth going and investigating that for a period of time and then move on. And I think that's a... I think it's a critical piece as people get involved in CTOs is to not get dogmatic about a technique or an approach or a device or whatever. It's right. just finding solutions, getting the artery opened up. And the more that you can accept failure, the more likely you will to be successful. Perfect. Great. If you, want, you would like to maximize that one too, but it looks, looks great. Yeah. So we're going to do – you want one more case, Hermanos? That's perfect. Yeah, if you can maximize that, uh, that, that uh, energy so you can see it a little bigger on the screen, it would be great. Yep. So this is a really unique case. So this is a 22-year-old girl with familial hypercholesterolemia. And she, uh, at age 17, actually underwent coronary bypass graft surgery with a lima to the LAD. She then, um, three years later, presented with uh, aortic stenosis and underwent a redo uh, sternotomy, bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement, and uh, a vein graft to the distal right coronary artery. Post her surgical course, uh, she had a profound RV failure and was brought back to the operating room at that time, and they put a second, uh, basically a Y graft off the graft to the right to the proximal right coronary artery. She did well for approximately two years until this hospital admission where she came back with recurrent unstable angina and was found to have, um, let me see if I have a picture of this. She was found to have an occluded right coronary artery. So you can see here's the composite Y graft. This goes down to essentially the PL circulation. She has the proximal graft coming to the proximal uh, right coronary. This segment is occluded into what is her PDA, which is the target territory, as she has infrawall ischemia, and essentially at this time class four angina. She had pain at rest on nitrates, which is why she got done semi-emergently. Now, the, the other interesting component here is it looks like one of the reason that the right was having so many issues is they, the valve strut essentially had been, unfortunately, placed over the ostium of the right. 
and uh, I think that essentially the right corner Austin is no longer a viable option to to open in this lady is she basically has tissue panis and valve struts over its ostium. That's going to be interesting. Yeah, so the plan was to come down via the this graft, work antegrade, try to sort out the anatomic ambiguity, and then try to do antegrade reentry into our PDA. Now, this lady, we took this shot. This lady was interesting to do the retrograde. If you can see, actually, the, the LAD is either a short segment and or a functional uh, CTO. And so the concept here is that if we needed to go retrograde, we wouldn't have to go down through this tortuous lima and then get into this, is that we would come down the native left and get into this territory retrograde that way. So unlike the last case, we'd have a lot less concern over potential hemodynamic compromise. So again, setting up all our options in advance and how we would approach each piece of the case. So your plan is to go undergrade first, and then if you need it, go retrograde, undergrade through the native. Like Correct. That was my plan. So she's got, again, it's very difficult, complicated anatomy because she, if we don't have her old films, which she has a high takeoff, uh, she has a high takeoff bifurcation, which is going to make it somewhat more difficult. So again, a lot of setup shots, and again, what I'm trying to figure out is how to get to this bifurcation and then get into the proper territory. It's a very confusing set of anatomy. So we wired the graft. We took a Pilot 200 with a Corsair. And the wire uh, eventually here is going to get where we want to go. So we then brought a wire down, and this is not where we want to go, because you can see we want to go down here. Probably marginal. Into the RV marginal. We then take this picture, which looks potentially promising, and the wire breaks free and pops up into that branch. What we find is we are across in the right place, which is good. But what happened is we actually got true to this, and now we're going into what is already grafted in the distal right, so that the the takeoff is right back in here. So I'm in the wrong place. So we have to figure out the anatomic ambiguity of this bifurcation as our next project. So this is, again, taking a picture showing there's our Y graft. This is going into the PL circulation, but the PDA takes off somewhere up in here. And that's going to be the next challenge is how do I get into here? Well, you don't like Ibis, but maybe Ibis is not be a bad idea here. No, I was uh, definitely would have been an option. I didn't do that, but that would be a very small option to try and find that takeoff. I ended up going in and sort of by feel got into a place and felt like we had got into the right architecture now. We've, you can see in an REO, we've got a nice angle to the right, and we're tracking, and you can see a dance beginning with the distal vessel and our yep. guide wire. So we got down to this point, and we're really getting close to where we want to do reentry. Again, we looked at orthogonal views to make sure we were dancing. And again, brought in a wire, and this time we just decided to knuckle just to make absolutely sure we're in the architecture. And you can see what happens classically with the knuckle is it, it barber poles or spirals around the vessel. So now we feel very confident that we're dancing, but in a somewhat tortuous reentry zone, so this is going to be really difficult to manage. We actually uh, did come down here with a cross boss, though you don't get to see it. This is a Miracle 12. You know, and I'm looking at the film, and you know, this is probably where I want to do reentry, but I'm starting to get hematoma and difficulty in seeing it. So we bring the stingray balloon down, and you can see the stingray balloon just right here, the two dots. So we're close to where we want to do the entry. So Bill, the vessel looks a little, a little diseased, they actually compressed and everything. How, what's your threshold for moving back and forth to, to find a different, better entry spot? Well, uh, you know, my, my, the problem, I didn't want to get too much further because I was going to start getting, you know, out into a, the, the distal vessel. And part of it was that there was so much calcium and fibrosity in, in this vessel. That was as far as the stingray balloon would go. So it was pretty much going to be my only place to do this without really getting more hematoma by trying to dilate. So I decided I would take one reasonably quick effort at this, 
and then I would move on to reverse carp. The other thing is we ended up having to use six French guides because her femoral arteries were so small. She's a little lady, and she had peripheral disease as well, so we're a little bit handcuffed using six French guides. So we went in. Again, you can see we've got now hematoma and some compression, so I'm really not in an optimal place to do reentry. I really like to be down here, as you were talking about, Monos. I just didn't get in as far as I really would have liked to, but okay. I thought I would take a quick shot at this. And again, it's the, if it works, great. If it doesn't, accept failure, and I was going to move on. So we <clears throat> stuck both ports <clears throat> and then went back in, and I tried to reenter with a pilot, and I was unsuccessful. So just like the last case, I accepted that my approach had failed, and we moved on to the next approach. So we left, pulled the stingray balloon out, left a knuckled wire in the distal right for a target, and we've now come back. We've engaged the left coronary, and we wired down. And I, because I can't, I don't have a third access point, I didn't put a, a radial access point to do the Lima. I'm trying to do tip injections to figure this where I'm going out. And eventually I get a decent picture, and we end up getting a wire to follow some really bizarre tortuous epicardial collateral from the apex, but clearly goes, and you can see it dances here. And so the movement in the feel, and again, this is a very high-end event, um, says we're in the right place. Oh, this is beautiful. And again, <laughs> when it starts dancing there, you feel really good. So. Good. Now we've got, again, now we've got set up for classic reverse cart with our 22-year-old. We've got guide extension, so balloon anti-grade, guide liner retrograde, balloon up, balloon down, balloon back, retrograde wire, straight into the guide liner. When do this, uh, do you have sometimes, you sometimes you this collateral, the smaller ones, when you start pushing real hard, the Corsair may kind of move a little bit. Um, uh, to, the, to the collateral. Do you have any problems with that? I know you talked about this in the past. So I, I, I think you're talking about evulsing the collateral. That it, yeah. The, yeah. The, key, the key with these kind of collaterals is you don't want to be pushing. You want to be spinning. Um, okay. And you've really got to, when you're playing with the guide wires and trying to knuckle and push and penetrate, is you have to at some point start thinking about how hard you're pushing because that is the concern down here is evulsing this collateral. And it's, it, you know, people have done it. It's one of the reasons people have come up with Caravelle and Fine Cross for these kind of smaller collaterals to try and avoid that. But really, the reason they get evulsed is because of push. So, and that's why Corsair and other cats are really designed to spin so that they sort of pull themselves across and they lower the coefficient of friction, but pushing is really the, the key piece you have to avoid so that you don't uh, potentially cause that problem. And it's not just with the microcatheter across the collateral, it's with the microcatheter across the occlusion segment, and also potentially with the guide wires as you're trying to push them or knuckle them into the appropriate locations. Perfect. So at this point, it becomes a somewhat standard PCI. Um, we decided to switch it into an anagrade only system just because, um, just trying to avoid issues there. It gets dilated, it gets stented eventually here. So, Bill, we had this uh, debate actually here in Dallas in our last CTO dinner about doing the TP in and, and getting the undergrade wire switch. And we had a case uh, from the, of our team here where actually they did that and then they lost the, everything. They had to abandon and come back in a couple of months. Uh, what is your threshold for this, and what's your preference for doing tip in versus just externalizing? Uh, I I rarely do tip in. I mean, the only reason I would do tip in is because I can't externalize the wire because of tortuosity, which usually occurs when you're through a vein graft, um, and the anastomosis angle is such that you can't get the wire to externalize. Um, I I don't do. I mean, most of my cases I I finish stenting on externalized wire. The only time I would switch antegrade is I'm worried about hemodynamic compromise. I'm worried, as in this lady, she was very symptomatic with a lot of pain while we were across her collateral. But even in that situation, you know, with the RG3 and R350, the likelihood of nose to nose entrapment is so low. It's a lot easier just to externalize, bring an antegrade microcatheter across the occlusion put it this way, and then do your swap out that way. So I don't think, I don't find tip-in to be that exciting. I don't worry about working on externalized wires. Sure. Um, and I actually strongly discourage people from tip-in because I think 
you know, you've got a great rail to deliver equipment. It's the best thing to deliver. You're not likely to lose care that way. So unless the patient is profoundly symptomatic or profoundly hemodynamic compromised, forcing removal of the gear, you might as well just quickly finish up stenting it and then be done, in my opinion. Sure. No, I completely agree with you. Uh, you know, actually, it's funny you said that because I had exactly the same feelings. Like, why would you want to do that? If you, like you say, if you're stable, unless you have another issue, just get it over with, better support, no issues of losing your access, and, and be done quickly. Yeah, I think the, the tongue-in-cheek answer is you, instead of being a CTO operator, you're acting like an interventional cardiologist. You want to have an anti-grade wire in. Um, but a CTO guy, you have an anti-grade wire, and it just happens to be externalized from the other side. And I think if you look at the benefits of an externalized wire, they far outweigh tip in and doing an anti-grade wire. No, absolutely. I think you're completely right. So that's her, her final angiographic result. So and she did good. So Perfect. I thought those are sort of some unique anatomic challenges to deal with and the hemodynamic support that might be good for people to see sort of what's going on. And I think the other piece is to show is that you've got to learn to accept failing and that there's no one perfect technique. It's, as we were showing through these cases, there were a lot of sort of mini algorithms where we moved along and moved into the next options uh, so that we could get success. Perfect. Perfect, Billy. These were great cases. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think we're actually going to post them online as well for people to see. Okay. But, uh, again, well, thank you so much. This was uh, awesome cases, very very good, very prov uh, thought-provoking for people to see and get new techniques. And uh, as you say, the, the key is getting the basics down and then uh, having the tools and you can tackle very, very complexly just like those ones, which was, you know, most people won't attempt, I think, but it's good to see what can be done at the experience yet. And I think that's the other key piece in this is remember it's about patients and there's most of the technical challenges out there can be solved and the key is to make sure that we're getting the patients taken care of as you build your skill sets, you know, make sure you know the people that you can mentor and work with to help get the patients cared for and also help you get better at what you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, that, and again, that also it works for CTO, it works for non-CTOs as well. The more you do, the better you get for your non-CTO procedures as well. So it works well for everyone. Absolutely. As, you, as you've shown with everybody, sharing Manos, you know, you've shared more information with people than just about anybody, and that really goes a long way to help operators willing to learn and explore new uh, techniques to get better at their craft. And I think that's a critically important skill for all interventionists is to look at how they can do their jobs better, not be satisfied with where they are at this time. Perfect. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Bill. We'd like to thank our uh, sponsors, Terumo and Abor Vascular, for uh, enabling this webcast to happen. So thank you so much, and, um, um, and we look forward to having you another webcast. And, Bill, thank you again for taking the time and sharing some very complex and very uh, didactic cases. My, my pleasure, Manos. Thank you, and good luck with the move. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.